This week, join me as I travel to the end of the earth. I'll journey into the heart of Africa to unravel the mystery behind one of the world's most legendary cities, Timbuktu. For centuries, it was known as an African El Dorado, a lost city of gold deep in the Sahara Desert. But what's the truth behind the stories? Where did all the gold come from? There's very little oxygen. It's hot, steamy. And what transformed a city in the middle of nowhere into a legend that still resonates today? We're digging for the truth and going to extremes to do it. Welcome to West Africa. I've traveled to the city of Bamako, the capital of Mali. Today, this is one of the poorest countries in the world, but it was once home to a mysterious empire awash in gold. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. For centuries, adventurers and explorers risked their lives crossing the Sahara to reach a place that has become synonymous with the remote and the exotic and a metaphor for the unattainable, the fabled Timbuktu. But what was it that gave the city its famous mystique? That's what I've come to find out. The legend of Timbuktu begins in the year 1324, when a huge caravan appears unannounced in the deserts outside Cairo. Emperor Mansa Musa is making his holy pilgrimage to Mecca, and he's doing it in style. His caravan includes 60,000 people and about 13 tons of gold. The Islamic world was amazed by this unknown black king who seemed rich beyond belief. Arab historians recorded that he spent so lavishly in Cairo, the Egyptian gold market crashed for years. Eventually, the stories reached Europe, spawning an obsession with Mansa Musa and his shadowy city of gold. A Spanish map from 1375 even shows the emperor sitting on his throne holding a nugget of gold. Over the years, many European explorers set off to find the mysterious Timbuktu, only to die trying. Some were overcome by the harsh conditions of the desert. Others met their fate at the hands of the fierce tribesmen of the Sahara. Meanwhile, the legend of Timbuktu and its elusive empire of gold continued to grow. I've heard all the legends, but I'm looking for the truth. So I'm starting my journey 500 miles southwest of Timbuktu in the heartland of Mansa Musa's Malian Empire. I want to find out if the African version of his golden story matches the Western one. Unfortunately, I can't rely on the written word. In this part of the world, that's not how they kept their history. But I have some options. I'm headed to the small village of Nafaji, just outside Bamako. Bubakar Belko Jalo, an author and expert on Malian culture, is taking me to visit a traditional oral historian, or griot. And right away, I learned something new. Bubakar tells me that in the West, he's known as Mansa Musa, but here in Mali, he's known as Kanka Musa, after his mother. Mansa was his title, meaning King of Kings. And I'm about to learn a lot more. That's the family of uh, the big, the king of the griots. The king of the griots. Yes. Lasana Kamisoko is one of the most renowned griots in Mali. His family goes back to the beginning of the Malian Empire. So the accumulated knowledge of centuries has been handed down to him. He's essentially a walking history book. Once the music starts, the words begin to flow. I don't even speak the language, and I'm engrossed in what he's saying. It's absolutely beautiful. So what is the story he's telling us right now? Kamisoko tells us of the powerful Malian Empire that existed between 1235 and 1645 AD. At its height, it stretched from Senegal in the west to Niger in the east, covering an area larger than all of Western Europe. Only the Mongol Empire of Genghis Khan was larger at the time. 
It was also very sophisticated socially. Bubakar tells me that the empire had a constitution that was codified in 1235, just 20 years after the Magna Carta. It was transmitted orally via the griots and guaranteed human rights for all citizens. So in the West, we often think about the Magna Carta being the first human rights document, where it seems that the Malian Empire started it around the same time. It was a great empire here. Yes, around the same time. Yeah, that's correct. But that was an oral human rights document, so yes. to speak, right? And not written, so no. many people don't know about that. Has he told us anything about the gold? Oh yes, he said there was a lot of gold here and uh, it all left, uh, you know, went uh, here and there. Yeah, he mentioned it. Could that be because of the pilgrimage of Kankamusa? Of course, he will never mention Kankamusa, but uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, Kankamusa uh, who took it. This is where the plot thickens. Kamisoko won't talk about Kankamusa at all. Bubakar tells me there's a lot of anger towards the emperor in this area. His golden pilgrimage may have made him famous abroad, but it also emptied the treasury and nearly bankrupted his country. Kankumusa is uh, somehow of a taboo around here. The recent, uh, he's uh, taking all the gold you know, away from uh, this, uh, this country. We could have spent nights and nights and nights listening to the king of Griot. We will never hear a mention of Kankumusa. So even to this day, there are consequences for spreading the story of Kankamusa. That's correct because I uh, heard the stories of uh, people who are even killed because you know they, they tried to, 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 to mention Kankamusa. In it's amazing to think that even now, 700 years later, just mentioning the man's name could get you killed. This is not at all what I expected to hear. But it's definitely time well spent. Kamisoka won't tell me the story of Kankamusa, but he does tell Bubakar about a secret place that might help me learn more about him. <laughs> Driven about an hour and a half outside Bamako and turned off the road at a marker that I've been told not to disclose. Bubakar has traveled ahead to ask permission for me to visit this very special place. Evidently, he has a site to show me that will shed some light on the story of Kankamusa. His directions lead me deep into the forest, along a narrow, overgrown path. The place I'm heading to is a little-known ruin called Fanfan. Bubakar has told me that it's very sacred and an important piece of the Malian Empire's history. Bubakar. Yes. Hunter. Eniche. Ma, Eniche. Welcome to Fanfan. What is Fanfan? Well, Fanfan is a place where they used to bring the princes to hide them and to educate them. So Kanka Musa himself may have spent time here. Who knows, maybe he might have been in this room. <laughs> Who knows? Right in here. Yes. Bubakar says that from the 13th century onwards, all the kings of the Malian Empire were trained here, including Kanka Musa. It's my first concrete link to the man himself. So this was a fort in a sense. Oh yes, it's a fortress, you see? Look at this wall here. This is the vestiges of, you know, that archaeological structure. Ah. And then you had, you know, layers of walls protecting this sanctuary. So has there been any archaeology done here then? Well, you know, it's not in our culture really to dig out our past. The way we dig our history is different from the way you do it uh, in the West. You know, you, 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 you dig sites, archaeologically speaking, you write documents, you write history down. Right. Here we don't do that. This won't tell you anything more than what I just said. But then if you want I've run into another taboo. It's forbidden to disturb sites as sacred as this one. It was hard enough just to get permission for me to visit. There's no way anybody would be allowed to dig here. Still, I can tell this was something special, even without formal archaeology. The oral history of Fanfan Fan is very detailed, and the fact that it's been kept secret tells me how important the site is. The griots may not tell me about Kanka Musa, but I'm getting closer to his story. So it's time to expand the search. I'm gonna follow the money. Like countless explorers before me, I'm searching for the gold of Timbuktu. I've met up with educator and guide, Kauri Berti. And together, we're seeking out the gold fields of the great Malian emperor, Mansa Kankamusa. Where did he get all his gold?
So was this area we're in once the heart of the Mali Empire? Mm, yes, you're right. We are in the Mande now. It's the heartland of the Mali Empire. And now we're heading to Narena. Narena is a, a famous place for traditional gold mining. How long have they been mining the gold in this area? They've been doing it since the time of a king, 700 years ago. The histories say that Kanka Musa brought close to 13 tons of gold on his pilgrimage to Mecca. This seems like an astronomical amount for the early 14th century, and the legends say he gave most of it away. I want to see for myself how he could have amassed such a huge fortune. We're going to the same place where he used to do gold mining, and we'll find some people there who are still doing the, tra the same traditional gold mining. I've heard that some people in Mali are angry with Kanka Musa because they feel he took the gold from Mali and gave it to everybody else. Is that true? Yeah, it's true. A lot of people believe that it's because of Kanka Musa that we do not have gold everywhere anymore. You think there's a chance we'll find gold today? Oh, yes, if you are lucky. If <laughs> you're lucky. But before we reach the gold mines, we have to make a stop. I need to bring a gift to the village elders as a sign of respect and goodwill before asking to explore their gold fields. So Cowrie's taking me to buy a sheep. I've never bought a sheep, so what's the going rate? Well, it's not so difficult anyway. When you are with me, we'll just try to do it right now. No I imagine if I tried to do it, I would get a very high price, right? Well, sometimes it happened because, because you are, we have a white, white color. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but Rookie. I'm sure that those people are very nice. They won't penalize you. Sounds like this negotiation will be a lot of fun. Okay, here we are, where ah. uh, we're going to find a sheep. I see the sheep right yeah. there. Hello. Uncle. Uncle. Is that Uncle? Is good afternoon? Good afternoon. Yeah. Uncle. Yeah. Uncle. We need a sheep. How much does he want for it to start? Uh, let me ask him. How much did he say? 30,000 uh, CFA. So that would be $60. $60, like, yes, yeah. a little high. <laughs> it's a little high, <laughs> yeah, so you think we yeah. should try lower? I think she'll, uh, she'll make it down. Let's see if he'll accept $40. Let's keep it at $1. Okay, he's going to make it down to $25,000. That is $50. So $50 basically, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. You worth 50 bucks? He seems like a, a good sheep. Okay. 25,000 CFA is a good deal. All right. All right. All right. So, 10, 15, 20, yeah. 25,000 yeah. CFA. Oh, I need to. I need to. I need to. My first sheep. Never bought one before. What are we going to name him? Uh, let's call him Friday. We'll call him Friday. Yeah, uh, Friday. It's pretty good. He's, uh, yeah, really. Yeah. Look at him. That's a good one. He's trained well. <laughs> got a very good one. There you have it. One sheep to go. In Mali, sheep ride on the roof. But there's a good reason for it, and Friday will be totally fine. The reason we have him up on the roof is because if we took him in the car with us, he'd be peeing and pooping all over the place. Narana is 54 miles south of Bamako. Kankamusa himself was born not far away. It's about a 90-minute drive through lush farmland until the dramatic rock formations tell us we're getting close. This is the gold mine right here, huh? Uh, we're getting closer. So, let me go up. Friday seems to have enjoyed the ride. All right. Got him? And the three of us head into the village to meet the elders. The tradition is that you should always hand it to the oldest person in the group. To the elder. To the elder, yeah. Uh, the men are here. Anche. 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 It looks like Friday has paid dividends. Anche. So they, are, they agree now that you visit the place. Thank you very much. Nice yeah. Yeah. A miner named Conte agrees to show us the village's mining operation. Uh, okay. <laughs> He's the guide here, you know. I wasn't sure what to expect from the mines, but it definitely wasn't this. It's like a scene from another place in time. The mines are really just round shafts dug deep into the earth, just wide enough for a man to climb down into. And from the looks of the miners, the work is very hard and very dirty. The site is incredible. Hundreds of people are working dozens of mine shafts as far as the eye can see. Kauri tells me there are countless mining communities just like Narana throughout southern Mali. As many as 200,000 people make their living working in the gold fields, 
just as they have for generation upon generation, going back even earlier than the time of Kanka Musa and his empire. Oh, this looks like a uh, very busy hole here. Yeah, it really. This must be a good one, right? Yeah, it's awesome. The yield around Narana is phenomenal. Kauri says that people have been working the same field for nearly 50 years. When a shaft runs dry, the miners just move a few feet away and dig a new one. When the field runs out, the entire village may pick up, move a few miles away, and start again. The exact way it's being done right now would be the exact way that Kanka Musa did it hundreds of years same ago. Same thing. Exactly the ago. same, no change at all. Just old ropes and yeah. buckets. And yes, that's it. What's the largest amount that someone has found in, in one day before, do you know? A few weeks ago, uh, a woman has got about 10 ounces in a day. That's thousands of dollars. Yeah, sure. In one day. Uh, yeah, Cowrie no, tells me that uh, even today, gold is Mali's most valuable export, to the tune of 60 tons per year. Most of that total comes from industrial mining, using modern heavy machinery. But still, every year, miners produce several tons of gold by hand using the same techniques their ancestors did a thousand years ago. That's enough for me. I want to experience myself what it took to gild an empire. All right, well, you think we're gonna get lucky? Uh, sure, I'm sure. You sure? <laughs> yeah. Climbing down into the mine shaft seems a little risky, so I have a few questions. Do any of these holes ever collapse? Oh, well, it happens, especially during the rainy season. And I'm going down there? Yeah. You're not helping me out here. <laughs> <laughs> but these people make their living doing this every day. To really appreciate what it's like, I've got to go underground. Uh, okay. He so said that it is uh, very hot inside. Uh, Why does that not surprise me? Uh, it's hot, huh? Right. You need to take off your shoes. Okay. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see all the guys that go down and have their shirts off, right? Okay. Okay. We're in the middle of the rainy season, and I can already tell that some of the handholds are very muddy. One slip, and it's 60 feet to the bottom with no good way for the miners to get me out. So I put on my climbing harness just in case. Don't leave me in there! <laughs> yeah. So it's 60 feet down. Hello! You can hear the echo. It's 110 degrees. There's no air. Yeah. And none of them can believe that I'm going down here right now. They all showed up just to watch. Yeah, no, no. I think they know something that I don't, but I think he's giving a shot. Okay. The first thing I notice, there's no air circulation inside the mine. As I descend, it becomes much harder to breathe, and my head begins to ache from the lack of oxygen. This is not an easy job. Uh, it's slippery. It's going to get even worse if it's raining. So I'll continue on down. So here I am in a hole 60 feet underground. It's about two and a half feet wide. I'm in knee deep mud. And there's water everywhere. These are the stones they look for down here that tell them that they're at the layer where the gold is. So they will scrape away at the wall here, fill up this bucket, and then haul it to the surface. Traditionally, the men descend into the mines while the women pull the buckets and do the panning. During the time of the Malian Empire, any gold nuggets that were found belonged to the emperor, no questions asked. But the miners were allowed to keep a percentage of any gold dust they found. And they do this for hours and hours, every single day. In the heat, 60 feet underground here in some of these holes. It's absolutely unbelievable. There's very little oxygen, it's hot, steamy. And people had to work really hard for that gold. So, if Kakamusa gave it all away, you could understand why people might be angry. I've sent a few buckets up. It's not for me. I think I'm gonna climb through the 60-foot tunnel back to the world up above. See you topside. Go! You got it! Woo! Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's slippery. 
<laughs> but even now, I'm only half done. The next step is to pan the earth I've dug up to see if I have anything to show for my labors. So should we go pan for gold now, see what yeah. we found? Yeah, that's it. That's it? Yep. Okay, let's go. In principle, it's a simple process. You literally wash the dirt. With a practice roll of the wrist, the women swish the water around to separate and discard the heavier rocks and clay. Eventually, if there's gold, it should separate from the fine black mud that remains. At least that's the idea. <laughs> You're not doing it the right way, you know. I'm not? That's why I'd be broke at this. Yeah. I make no money. Huh? Nothing, you know, like Nothing. It. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. Another bowl all the way down at the bottom of the hole, 60 feet down. Oh, oh! <laughs> I take that back. That's the fruits of my labor. <laughs> One little fleck of gold. Actually, I'm luckier than I thought. My second bucket does yield some gold, about a gram and a half or so, worth about $40. When you think about all the hours that go into this, digging the hole, pulling all the dirt out, and sifting through it, there's the byproduct right there. These little gold flakes, but just one bowl can make it all worthwhile. And the people here have been doing this for over 800 years, and they're doing it the same way that Konkamusa did. It was definitely worthwhile for me. It was a lot of work to get just a few specks of gold, a far cry from the nearly 13 tons Konkamusa brought on his pilgrimage. But this is just one bucket. Multiplied by thousands of people, it isn't hard to see how the emperor could have amassed enough gold to amaze the world. But Timbuktu is still 500 miles away. How did gold from down here make that city so famous? I've traveled 350 miles from the gold fields of Narana to the central Niger Valley to pick up the trade routes north to Timbuktu. Welcome to Mopti, the main port along the Niger River. This waterway is the super highway through West Africa. For centuries, boats have been leaving Mopti and its neighbor Jene to carry goods north. Everything from textiles to food to spices, but more importantly, gold. I'm going to follow the path of the gold all the way to Timbuktu. Sheen Wellegam is a local merchant river and river guide. On that trip will take three days to Timbuktu. Sounds like a fun journey. So is this our boat? He's agreed yes, to join me for my trip. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm looking forward to finally reaching the end of the earth. But I also want to find out how the Niger River helped gold from hundreds of miles away turn Timbuktu into a legend. How important was this river to the Malian Empire? Ah, this river was very important for trading. So then, these boats and this river make life better for the people of Mali. Yes, that's why we call this river, River of Life. This river is the Niger. river of life? Yes. The Niger River has always been the main artery of West Africa. Today, its 2,600 miles flow through five countries. In the days of Konkamusa, it linked all the regions of his vast empire. So the furthest north you can go on the river is Timbuktu, right? Yes, Timbuktu is where the canoe made the camels. And all the things come from the Arab country, Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco was coming through in Timbuktu. So that's where the camel meets the canoe? Yes. So all the goods that arrive by boat are then transported over land by camel? Yes, the trading from the north and the south all was coming in Timbuktu. Sheen says its location on the northernmost point of the Niger made Timbuktu a critical trade center and a link between two different worlds. For the Arab caravans coming down from the north, it was the access point for the river and the lands to the south. For the goods coming up the river, it was also a port to the vast ocean of sand that led to the cities of the Mediterranean. So basically, it's the gateway to another world. Yes, but... This trade and the cultural interaction that came with it made Timbuktu a very wealthy and cosmopolitan city. As we move further north, I can see the evidence of this mixing. That is a beautiful building. Is that the mosque for the village? Yes, that is very nice mosque for all the villages. Where did that architecture come from? Oh, that is brought by Kanku Musa. Kanku Musa brought that to Mali. Yes. This architectural style combines the adobe buildings of Africa with the soaring spires of traditional Islamic mosques. 
Its evolution was the direct result of Konka Musa's journey to the Middle East. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's very beautiful. A few miles later, we see a more modern use of the canoes, called pirogues, that ply the river. So not only are the pirogues used for trade on the river, it's also a national sport. Each village competes against one another. And these guys are training for a national race. They've been paddling like this for the last mile. Yeah, keep it up, guys. Woo! Sheen says that these boats are all made by hand, using wood that itself is traded upriver. They're a smaller version of the cargo boats that travel up and down the Niger, and their design hasn't changed at all in hundreds of years. Kanka Musa himself may have witnessed a very similar scene back in the day. So are these guys gonna go all the way to Timbuktu like this? Oh, they can go. They are very strong, they can go to Timbuktu. After we congratulate the winners, it's back to our trip. We have 230 miles to cover between Mopti and Timbuktu, so we have lots of time to experience life on the river. It's very interesting to see how lush and green everything is down here. It's a stark contrast to the land that's further north, which is all desert. So the people who live up in Timbuktu and even further beyond rely on the goods from down here to maintain their way of life. Look at the size of that boat and how many people and goods are on board that. The more time I spend on this river, it really shows me how important it is to the way they live their lives. Because without it, they would have less food, Less produce, less goods. But what brought all the gold from the south up to Timbuktu? Sheen tells me that it was traded for a specific commodity that was just as important as gold in West Africa and that was only available in the markets of Timbuktu. Salt. The question is, how could something as commonplace as salt launch a city to greatness? I'm about to find out. After a long journey, I finally arrived in the middle of nowhere. The first thing I can tell you about Timbuktu is that it definitely lives up to its reputation as being remote. It took me three airplanes just to get to West Africa. Then there was the 4x4. I spent three days in a boat on the Niger River, and I just did this last little portion on foot, and I'm finally here. But after all I've been through, it's not what I expected. It's hard to imagine this dusty outpost was ever a bustling center of trade. I find it difficult to believe that something as mundane as salt could build an oasis of gold in the middle of the desert. I need to get a better understanding of why salt is so important in West Africa. This looks like a good place to start. Maintaining a healthy salt balance can be challenging in such a harsh climate. Dehydration is a constant concern. This much I know from experience. But I don't know enough about the particular health issues here in West Africa. Dr. Ah, yes. Hey, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Yes, I am. Dr. Don Kamara is a former physician for the Peace Corps here in Mali. I'm hoping she can fill me in. So I know from personal experience that the balance between electrolytes and water in your body in the desert is very important. But are there any other things here in West Africa that would make that very critical? Oh yeah, Be here in West Africa and especially in Mali, there's lots of diseases, things like malaria, typhoid fever, a lot of gastrointestinal illnesses like amoebiasis, giardiasis, all of which will ensure that you lose water and salts. So the people here not only battle the environment, but they're also battling clinical issues as well. Exactly. If you've got a loss of sodium from the body, you will have a corresponding loss in the levels of water in your extracellular fluid in your blood. So far, I've managed to avoid all these problems. But dozens of explorers weren't so lucky. If you'd like to see for yourself, 
I've got a machine back here that can measure the levels of salt and other electrolytes in your blood. If you care to be a sort of guinea pig here for me, <laughs> I can carry you back there and show you how it's done. Okay, so you're offering me a job as your lab rat, come huh? On. If you're game, come on back here. <laughs> okay. Here come the needles. Have a seat here on my table. Uh, Relax, you're good with having blood drawn? Oh yes, yeah, I only pass out. You're not gonna out pass like out. Uh, 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 let this not uh, be one of those times. Now's the point where you want to close your eyes for those of you who are squeamish. All right, here mm -hmm. we go. In your hands. Okay. Excellent. Painless. Press hard. All right. Here I've got one of the panels that are used in the machine. This is what you use to test your blood. Oh, and it fans out. It fans out on its own. It's kind of like a biological DVD, huh? Exactly. It's what <laughs> they call spectrum analysis. I'm very interested to see how this uh -huh. uh, how this turns out. Yes. Ah, analysis complete. Ah, there we go. Let's see what your reading says here. Okay. As you see, this gives you the levels of sodium, potassium, your chlorides. Okay. So it looks like I'm falling within the range of a normal, healthy individual right now. That's so. Calcium. My salt levels are fine, which is not surprising. I'm healthy, and I haven't been here long enough to pick That's up any right. illnesses. All you need to do is... But in a landlocked country like Mali, salt is a commodity that no one can take for granted. And as I'm about to find out, it's still at the very center of life here. A way of life that's barely changed since the time of Kanka Musa. I, I love driving in the desert. I'm heading out into the Sahara Desert north of Timbuktu. I'm with Ali Old Sidi, director of Timbuktu's cultural mission. And we're looking for one of the few remaining salt caravans. This is great, right at sunset. We've been expecting... The Tuaregs, nomads from the deep desert, have run these caravans for centuries. The camel, you know, is a good friend. Oh, definitely out here. We spent two weeks without drinking water. <laughs> That's good to have when it takes two and weeks to get here. And all the camels were carrying these giant salt slabs they, Each of them is carrying between three and four pieces. How far have they traveled? Uh, they travel Ali tells me the caravans travel to Timbuktu from a place called Taudeni, deep in the Sahara, over 400 miles to the north. There, an ancient lake bed contains a staggering 7 million tons of salt. The slabs are hacked right out of the earth, just as they have been since the Middle Ages. As the sun sets, we're invited to join the Tuaregs for tea and spend the night. Beautiful morning out here in the desert. It was time to get to work. Oh. Help, help them. Yep. They work so fast. <laughs> this is your first time, don't mind. The salt slabs <laughs> weigh about 60 pounds each, and we pile them on. That's a lot of salt. You see, it's heavy. That's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Getting a little unruly back there. That's 240 pounds of salt right camel. there. Is there anybody to taste this? Yeah. You just lick it? Yeah. yeah. It's nutritious, it's yeah. How did you find it? Is it strong? Tastes half like salt, uh -huh. half like camel. <laughs> <laughs> Most caravans today number about 40 camels. But Ollie tells me that at the height of the salt trade, they could stretch into the thousands. In those days, salt was said to be worth its weight in gold. In fact, it was often called white gold. The trade caravans from the Mediterranean would pick up salt on their way to Timbuktu to increase their profits and to exchange for Malian gold. But the caravans also brought something else of value, knowledge. Gold is coming from south. Salt is coming from north. But knowledge is mainly found in Timbuktu. It became a, a famous city, a learning center. The root of salt and the yes. root of knowledge, huh? Exactly. When Mansa Kanka Musa returned from his famous pilgrimage to Mecca, he brought back a vision to transform the jewel of his empire into a great capital of Islamic learning in the desert. He invited architects and scholars from the Middle East to build mosques and universities. Some of them still stand today. I returned to Timbuktu with a new appreciation. Islam has been the lifeblood of the city ever since and it had a particular character that's still reflected today. 
Philippe Royce, an expert in Arab and Islamic history, takes me to visit a traditional Islamic school, or madrasa, where I can see it for myself. Islam in, in West Africa is very tolerant, and, and there is not the kind of problem you can find in other Islamic countries. Today, the word madrasa makes many people think of terrorist training camps full of hate. Here in Timbuktu, it couldn't be more different. The boys and girls in this school are studying together, following in the city's long tradition of tolerance and diversity. Philippe next takes me down the street to the Sankori Mosque to show me the full expression of this tradition. During the Middle Ages, this was the Harvard or Yale of the Muslim world. And after Kanka Musa's pilgrimage to Mecca, didn't yeah. Timbuktu just grow tremendously? Yes, exactly. And how many people were we talking about? There was about uh, 100,000 people. And how many of those were scholars? Quite a part of them. 25,000 yeah. 25, scholars? 000, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this was a, a city of great knowledge then. Yes, absolutely. It was absolutely incredible. It is unique, I think, in the world. Uh, so the city they, developed they such from, a reputation uh, that scholars came from all over the Muslim world to study not only Islam, but astronomy, mathematics, history, and medicine. By the mid-16th century, Kanka Musa's dreams had come true. Timbuktu rivaled Cairo and even Mecca as a center of learning, boasting over 150 schools. But if the golden age of Timbuktu is long gone, Philippe tells me that some of its treasures do remain. I came to West Africa to unravel the legend of Timbuktu, the lost city of gold of the great Malian emperor, Kanka Musa. I found the gold fields far to the south, where thousands still mine the same way their ancestors did in the Middle Ages. But I learned that the most valuable commodity in this ancient land is not yellow gold, but white. The rock salt that travels to Timbuktu from deep in the Sahara Desert. All this wealth helped Timbuktu grow into one of the intellectual capitals of the Muslim world. At its height, this was definitely not the middle of nowhere. And Philippe Royce tells me that the city's greatest treasure can still be found. But it's not what I might expect. Abdel Qadir Hydra is a scholar, the patriarch of one of Timbuktu's oldest families. So where is he taking us right now? He's going to, to show us his treasures. Treasures? Yeah, they are all preserved in this room. Wow, I'm definitely intrigued. Wow. Look at all of that. It's a lot of treasure. What's ever in there? Boxes. Box Simple boxes. Boxes full of treasure, I'm thinking, yeah. huh? Well, whatever's in here is heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. Certainly, certainly feels like treasure. Ah, oui. Une autre encore. So we can pull another one out? Yeah. More treasure. Ooh, oh, God. Look at how old this is. This has got to be something good. Wow, look at that. Ancient texts and manuscripts. Wow. Exactly. Plenty of them. And how far back do they date? From the 16th century. From generation to generation until him. So he is the keeper of the manuscripts. Exactly. Nowadays, he's the one. Yes. They tell me that for centuries, manuscripts like these were some of Africa's best-kept secrets. Some of them date back nearly a thousand years and originated as far away as Damascus or even Baghdad. And there are dozens of family collections like this one. Would it be possible for him to show us one of the books? It's a beautiful binding. They seem to be bound. But uh, they are not. And what is incredible is that they are preserved without any binding and without any numbering of the, the pages. So all the families had a tradition of conserving it very well. And so there must be hundreds, if not thousands, of manuscripts. Yes, he has. Come uh, in, Milach, to that, Andak. 9,000 manuscripts. I mean, what happens if the insects or yeah. elements get to yeah. them? Yeah, it, it happened a lot. You'll see. Open it. Oh, yes, okay. These are manuscripts that have seen the effects of time, weather. Exactly, exactly. No, these, as you see, have dust. Uh, it was burnt, uh, eaten by termites. Uh, the rain uh, water came in. So 
What can we do with that? You see, it's a tremendous thing. It's a shame. They tell me that thousands of volumes like these were hidden away by families anxious to protect them from conquerors and colonizers. These priceless remnants of Timbuktu's golden age are only now coming back to light. They're stored in back rooms or buried in the sand with no record of what they contain. But many others have now been cataloged and are preserved in dozens of bibliotheques or libraries all over the city. It's here at the Mama Hydra Library that Abdel Qadir safeguards the 4,500 manuscripts he's already identified. Where? Oh, this is beautiful. And so this is the part of his collection that he's cataloged. Yes. What do we have here? Well, we have almost everything, but mainly uh, manuscripts on Islamic studies. But we have also some manuscripts of uh, Aristotle, uh, Plato, uh, Pythagoras, and different uh, Greek uh, philosophers and doctors. Philippe tells me that many classical texts were translated into Arabic while Europe was still reeling from the Dark Ages. There could be unknown passages or even entire works from writers like Plato, Aristotle, or Pythagoras preserved here that exist nowhere else in the world. So because they come from all over, you're not just getting one-sided teachings, you're getting teachings from different perspectives, different empires. Exactly. Maybe some hidden pearl could appear, and it is our work to make it known to everybody. So there's much hard work yet to be done. Yes. Worldwide interest in these new discoveries has launched a renaissance in Timbuktu. Grants have helped establish study centers where manuscripts are painstakingly cataloged and preserved. At the government-run Ahmed Baba Center, Philippe shows me something even more exciting. Let's go in. Well, this is certainly a lot different than the rest of Timbuktu. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Here is where we having all the scanning. So the thousands of manuscripts that are in these family libraries are now going digital. It's hidden now, and we have to make it available to everybody. So they have already 30,000 manuscripts here in the Ahmed Baba Center. A lot of work to be done. Yeah. A lot, <laughs> a lot. In a, a very uh, short time, uh, a lot of people will be able to know what's on here. The plan is to make the manuscripts of Timbuktu accessible digitally to scholars all over the world. So all these treasures that have been stored here for hundreds of years are just now beginning to surface to the rest of the world. We are just at the tip of the iceberg. Who knows what we find? In the years to come, these ancient volumes may well rewrite Africa's past as Timbuktu reclaims its golden age. As for me, I've come full circle. As you can see in this one, you have uh, the name of Kanka Musa here. Kanka Musa. So is, is this the story of his pilgrimage? Exactly. Kanka Musa's own story is right in front of me. As written here in Timbuktu in the 16th century. I think it's safe to say that the emperor would be very proud.